The Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals is about to hear arguments on whether to uphold a ruling issued last week that postponed the October 7th California recall election. Here's live coverage of the Circuit Court on C-SPAN. This is what the Honorable the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit will now draw near. Give your attention and you will be heard. Please be seated. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the time for oral argument in the court's rehearing on bank of the case of Southwest Voter Registration Edu Education Pro uh, Project at all versus Shelley. The appellants may proceed. Chief Judge Schroeder, and may it please the court. With me at council table are Ben Wisner, John Eulen, Tom Goldstein, and Lawrence Tribe. With the court's indulgence, um, we would propose us to uh, share the argument. Professor Tribe would begin. He would focus principally on the equal protection issues and the remedy issues concerning the recall election. I would then focus on the Voting Rights Act issues and the remedy issues with regard to the two initiatives. That's fine. Mr. Tribe. Chief Judge Schroeder, and may it please the court. This is a case about some very basic propositions under the U.S. Constitution, propositions <coughs> that the California voters, quite notably, added last year to their own constitution in Section 2.5 of Article 2 as a direct response to the Florida election debacle with punch card balloting. Each person's <laughs> vote under this provision of the Constitution gets counted, and it gets counted equally with every other vote. Professor Things. Tribe, before we get into that detail, help me with the standard of review that would apply in this case. We have an, an order from Judge Wilson denying preliminary injunction, and it's up to us to apply it in what way? What, what's the appropriate standard of review? Judge Scanlon, it is really a pure question of law here, as we view it, and therefore we're not suggesting anything other than de novo review. We don't think it would be appropriate to defer uh, to the judge, except insofar as he might have made factual determinations, but he made no factual findings, so we suggest it's de novo. But I thought our own Ninth Circuit law required that even in denials of preliminary injunctions that the standard of review is very deferential. Gregorio T., mm -hmm. for example, suggests that we don't review the underlying merits of the case as long as <clears throat> the trial judge gets the law right, notwithstanding the fact that we might have applied the facts differently. That's right. We still have to defer. Is, is that not Your Honor, the law of this circuit? Uh, I think if the trial judge got the law right, uh, I wouldn't be here. Uh, it does seem to me the law of this circuit certainly suggests uh, that you're not second-guessing the trial judge. But when we come to the fundamental issues of constitutional law at the heart of the case, it seems to me that either you will agree with our legal view or uh, we will not prevail. It seems to me that as things now stand, uh, on October 7th, about half the voters in California, the ones in the six counties using uh, punch card machines with disproportionately high minority populations, will be several times as likely to have their votes discarded or misread. Uh, there is no contrary evidence, no contrary this is, finding. This is based, Professor Todd, this is based on the affidavits, the two affidavits in the, in the That's record. Right, principally. Uh, Saltman and, and Breyer. Uh, the the uh, the Caltech. Yes, <coughs> it's it's and based it's based very much on the Brady. Uh, Bra Brady, I'm sorry. Brady, not Breyer. Uh, so, declaration. So I, I was studying those affidavits uh, prior to the oral argument, and I was trying to figure out when uh, the professor discusses the error rate in, in uh, the various systems, he stops with the machine count. I, is that not right? He starts with it, that's right. And he stops with it. He doesn't include any recapture of lost ballots that might happen as a result of a recount. That's right. He looks 
as I recall it, at the way the machine what operates. What happens when the, the machine stops counting? Right. He says there's a bunch of ballots that don't get counted when you're done. But as we know from Florida, uh, you can go back and recapture some of those votes. That's right. Of course, as we also know from Florida, no, just, just the, say, the view me, is it could cut just, either way. Let me just m make sure, sure I understand. He does not take the process to the end. He does not say, he does not look at what the, ra what the rate of error is when you get done through the entire process. I, I believe that, uh, I, just I, I think that's right, although, although if I'm, if I'm Recalling the details of, of his research design incorrectly, I'm sure Mr. Rosenbaum will. I didn't will see me. it. Perhaps co counsel right. can come up. Now, given that that's the case, and given that California, unlike Florida, has uniform procedures, which we have in the excess of record provided by Mr. Costa, uh, sort of burdensome and oppressive, I would say, or lengthy procedures dealing with what happens during recounts. So we don't have the Bush versus Gore problem. We don't have the problem that it's human it's beings apply to no, the it's, it's, a, it's a worse problem in the sense that it's unmistakable that the state of California has decided, taking all of that into account, that the error experienced with these now notorious ballots even after human beings look at them is so great that they are not lawful to use once but, but just they've so been deemed deficient just, just so and the outmoded. Mr. Brady, or Professor Brady, does not tell us the error rate when you're done with the whole process. I think that's correct. So we don't know. It is entirely possible that when you're done with the entire process, punch card ballots are no worse than any other system. Well, we would, I it's think. It's possible as far as the record discloses. I, I think, Judge Kaczynski, although it's not an impossibility, the experience is such that getting the people of California to believe that this is not a second class technology, now that it has been deemed deficient, uh, because it is outmoded would be quite a task. I think that the starting point is not just a quantitative difference between uh, punch card ballots and optical scan and other ballots, but a qualitative difference. But you do agree that the specific problem that troubled the Supreme Court in Bush versus Gore, and that is that you had human beings applying inconsistent standards to the counting of Ballots. That was one of the problems. Th that, that problem does not exist in California. Well, it, certainly, when I not looked, in this, certainly not in this case. That's right. When I looked at the detailed rules in California, when it comes to the very end, when it says if it's ambiguous, then we're not quite sure what you do. You look at the intent of the voter. So I think we are fooling ourselves if we f imagine that California has outdistanced Florida in a fundamental way. But the real point that disturbed the Supreme Court in Bush v. Gore with respect to what was happening was not only human beings, it was that there were demonstrable differences in some counties, uh, over votes were counted, in others they were not, and it was the fundamental fact that there was not in place any sufficient safeguard to make sure that every person's vote counted the same way. What do we know about the error rate of the Inca vote system that LA County intends to use in March of 2004? Uh, we only know that the Secretary of State has certified it as acceptable uh, and is apparently satisfied that because it works like the punch card ballot, except that you don't have the problem of hanging chads or dimple chads you use, the familiar pen, uh, it is expected to be more user-friendly and more accurate. But you do have the same problem with overvotes and undervotes because there's no, uh, as I understand it, uh, precinct uh, uh, scanning. Uh, yes, Judge Tashima, some of the problems persist in, in Los Angeles. And we don't know the degree to which uh, that's going to uh, differentiate uh, that optical scanning system from the... But we do know this, and I think this is quite important when we are dealing with a matter of such, of such great moment. We do know that the Secretary of State of California, who is charged with determining on the basis of the best information known to him, whether a form of ballot is deficient 
or outmoded or otherwise unacceptable. We know that that determination has been made favorably with respect to the techniques that will be in use everywhere except in these six counties. And so the question of law presented is whether it is consistent with equal protection of the laws, not just Council, the way Are Bush you suggesting Council, me, that best available technology then becomes the standard in no. these electoral challenges? Uh, no, certainly, uh, I don't think so, Judge McEwen. And the reason is that we are not suggesting uh, that perfection uh, is important. We are suggesting that when the state has in place a mechanism for deciding what is unacceptably poor, not up to snuff, it is not permissible without a better reason than mere coincidence uh, and the serendipity of timing and the accident of geography to use that method which is deemed deficient by the state itself and which will be phased out uh, in March of, two, of 2004 when there are available methods that the Secretary of State has found acceptable and even if those methods however as you discussed before with Judge Tashima might not be Perfect. as acceptable, and nobody suggests anything should be perfect right. in the electoral world, but that there will still be inherent errors in those, particularly in those counties that don't have the precinct scanning. So how do you then distinguish between the punch card ballot, which has some error in it, which is, I think, agreed by the state, and the error which will also be inherent in the new scanning system? See, for, I think for this court, or for the district court to take unto itself the task of second guessing the determination of the responsible state officials as to which of these methods, though all of them have some errors, which of these methods are understood to be so rife with inherent problems that they are unacceptable and which are not. Council, Council I have a couple of problems with what you're saying. The first is Judge the I'm core sorry. of your argument seems to be that Bush v. Gore should be extended to this case. There's a no, sentence Excuse me, Judge Kleinfeld. I, I read the brief. I, I, I understand, and but I, extended is a word that I'm I think this case is simpler than Bush well, v. Gore. Let, let, me, let me ask you a question about Bush v. Gore. There's a sentence in it that appears to me to expressly distinguish this case. The court wrote, quote, the question before the court is not whether local entities in the exercise of their expertise may develop different systems for implementing elections, close quote. There, the Supreme Court seems to recognize that different localities within states may have different voting systems, and they expressly distinguish and limit Bush v. Gore right. Let me in say, that decision. Not Judge Kleinfeld, I, I'm glad you focus on that language because it seems to me that one of the four facets of Bush v. Gore uh, that we think is quite uncontroversial and that we happily embrace uh, is the fact that the favorable view of decentralized small government with play in the joints, uh, with local entities exercising their own expertise uh, that was expressed in that opinion uh, does not extend under Bush v. Gore itself, and that was the whole point of the preceding and following paragraphs, does not extend to decisions about how and when the conduct of a statewide count of ballots under one supervisory authority uh, do or do not adequately protect the fundamental right of each voter to cast a ballot that it is given the same weight. In other words, the fundamental difference was if individual independent counties come up with their own systems, the value of local government counts for a good bit in the calculus. But when, as in this case, the values of localism and autonomy have been superseded by a uniform statewide determination that this technology has got to go. Well, they didn't, decide, to they didn't decide that the technology was unacceptable because of its error rate. They said it was outmoded. Narrow ties are outmoded, but that doesn't mean oh, there's anything in context, wrong. In context, I want to make sure I don't have too narrow ties. <laughs> uh, in context, Judge Kleinfeld, when the accompanying statement dealt with the error rate and when you read it in terms of outmoded and therefore unacceptable, it's clear they don't just mean out of fashion. And the point that I think is, is important to make is that in this case, uh, the reason that we end up using the 
outmoded system, the system deemed unacceptable instead of the new one, is purely an accident of timing. I calculated the number of days, and if it turned out that rather than pulling all the petitions together as quickly as they did and submitting them, the number of signatures uh, hitting the right number on July 23rd, if they wait, waited till the end of the 160-day period, went to September 2nd, they would then have had 180 days because of the provision of Section 15B of Article 2 of the Constitution, oh, namely so until so March, I have a, can, until I have, March I to have a hold the ele that, election. That is, that is, to me, fundamental. You've asked us to focus on the certification and decertification of the machinery by the Secretary of State as being the basis of the equal protection argument, divorced from the actual error rate that results. And that seems to ask us to uh, make the leap instantly from a state law violation to an equal protection violation. If the uh, error rates are assumed to be the same, why would it matter whether the Secretary of State has approved one method and not the right. other? You've, you've seen to Judge Graber, I, to, I, to I do that. think that if it were the case that all this label meant was it's out of fashion, it would be hard to attach that significance. But in the Allegheny Coal case and in Papasan against Allain in 1986, the Supreme Court made clear that when the state itself establishes a baseline of a policy and then departs from it in some inexplicable way. In Papasan via Lane, for example, there was a distribution of money to schools which did not follow any coherent policy and which was not explainable in terms of the values of localism. And the court said, therefore, the Rodriguez decision, San Antonio Board v. Rodriguez, is not dispositive. The state has to come up with at least a reason. And that didn't even involve the fundamental right to vote. But, when but, in, we but have in this case, there was no finding that these are inaccurate. Uh, the Secretary of State can decertify for any number of reasons, including the fact that they sort of have a bad order as a result well, of... Well, not quite any number of reasons. Well, it there has to be... There were three, deficient, obsolete, is obsolete and therefore unacceptable. Now, how does one read as in, in the plain meaning of he, obsolete people, and therefore unacceptable? He may have felt that uh, people have lost confidence in them, even but though they're accurate enough, wouldn't loss because, of of, because of Florida. And but people people sort of uncomfortable with it, so he'll change the technologies. Uh, Judge Kaczynski, wouldn't the fact that the populace, whose alienation from the system of governance is something powerfully to be avoided, has lost confidence in something, they may have lost backed confidence. up by a great deal of evidence that it is unreliable, backed up by common sense about how easy it is to make errors. But there's no machine. finding. The Secretary of State made no finding. You want to rely. You say, don't look at the error rate. It doesn't matter because the state has made a finding. And there simply is no finding of uh, an unacceptable error rate. Judge Kaczynski. Is there? That, that, or did I miss it? No. There is no finding of any kind here. Why isn't that the end of the case? It, the reason it isn't the end of the case is that we're not counting but sheep. 30 minutes. We're, we're, we're not. <laughs> it's because we're not counting sheep. We're counting votes. And it matters that people do or don't have confidence. And it's not as though there is no evidence. There's overwhelming evidence. So it's evidence. unconstitutional if the press gave it a bad name? No. It's not just the press. I have more confidence in the collective capacity of the culture to... What, what the studies in, in the excerpts of records show is that the voting machine technology in use in six counties with 44 percent of the votes results in something over one percent more undervotes and overvotes. The Caltech MIT study Thanks. further shows that at least a third of those undervotes and overvotes are intentional, possibly more because it's easier to undervote and overvote on the purpose. Author of, with the, the author machines. of that study said that its use in that way was, in his word, <clears throat> absurd. That's at page 189 of the excerpts of record. But I really must save some yes. time for my colleague and for rebuttal. So I, I wish I could respond. Maybe when I get up again, I will Thank try you. to be responsive to you. have plenty of time to think of one. Thanks. <coughs> Mr. Rosenbaum, are you um, going to save a little time on rebuttal? I hope so, Your Honor. Okay. Um, <laughs> Your Honor, Your Honors, let me, I want to spend the bulk of my time on the question of the Voting Rights Act. <coughs> Mr. Rosenbaum, before you get into that, I want to renew my same question that I asked Professor Tribe. 
But aren't we supposed to apply an abuse of discretion standard when we re review the denial of a preliminary injunction? Judge O'Scanlan, I agree with Professor Tribe. The, the, the problem with the district court decision wasn't that there were a set of facts that he made findings on and that we're here today saying there wasn't sufficient evidence to support them. The problem was that in terms of the fundamental analysis of the equal protection claim and the fundamental analysis of the voting rights claim, that was an error. And this court has always held in Gregorio T, in the case I honored in front of, argued in front of your honor, the 209 case, mm -hmm. um, that the question was a basic question in terms of the question of law itself. Let me turn, I want to... The district judge was supposed to weigh four factors, the probability of success on the merits, irreparable harm to the plaintiff, balance of hardships, and public interest. We're supposed to review those under our precedents uh, for Honor, abuse of discretion rather error, than de novo, and aren't the we? error that Judge Wilson made, one of the errors that Judge Wilson made was that he fundamentally misstated the law with respect to equal protection and the Voting Rights Act. Let me turn very quickly to three points that were raised and then I'll turn to the Voting Rights Act. Judge Kaczynski, here's the problem with the recount. Your Honor is absolutely correct that Dr. Brady's analysis did not deal with what would happen in terms of a recount, but there's two points with respect to that. First of all, it is impossible with the, with the punch card machines to do a recount with respect to overvotes. There's no question about that. There's no dispute about that. Secondly, even with respect to undervotes, even with respect to undervotes, a recount is not going to capture those undervotes where, in fact, there has not been a piercing such that there's a hanging or dimpled chad with all the difficulties attendant to Bush. I, I, the, my, I, I do understand all that. My, my broader but, point, Judge, is we, we don't know. We know a lot about the problems of recounting punch cards, but we don't know a lot about the problems of recounting, for example, touch screens or the problem of recounting uh, um, optical scan ballots. know that the sort of intrinsic problems that exist with respect to punch cards don't exist that. And there's a broader point Those here. Those don't, but we don't know that other problems don't. For example, if somebody misaligns the ballot and marks next to it, and marks, mar mar when you marks hit slightly. A, when you hit a touch screen, it's a terrific point, Judge Kaczynski, because when you hit a touch screen and you've completed your ballot, you can look at that ballot. It will not accept an overvote. It will absolutely not register an overvote. And with respect to an undervote, you can... You it can goes into a machine, and the machine is a computer. The computer can... There's all sorts of things that can happen with the, with, 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 the, with, the, with the programming of the computer. Is there a paper audit trail? Let, there, let's say there is a dispute. Actually, there, is a, there is a trail with respect to that. But the broader principle, Judge Kaczynski, is this. And that is, notwithstanding the problems that you and I are talking about, the right to vote has never been dependent upon the existence of a recount. The right to vote exists uh, with respect to any vote that is cast. And that's the problem with but, this, but, this but system. No, no, no. The, the, you can't tell, you can't talk about differential error rates in the various systems and stop with the machine reading of the ballots. If you have any significant possibility of recapturing lost votes, you have to go to the end of the process. And all I've talked to Professor Tribe about this, that Dr. Brady does not go to the end of the even process. If, even if I agreed fully with the court, it doesn't answer Professor Tribe's point with respect to the certification, which I'm going to come to in a, in a half a moment. And, f and furthermore, Your Honor, it, it is, it's academic. It's, it's, an, it's a moot point here because recount cannot capture the basic problems with respect to punch cards. Judge Tsushima, you asked about the Inca vote. Let me tell you, let me tell you what the Secretary of State has said with respect to the Inca vote. The Secretary of State has said, and I'm referring to pages 359 through 388 of uh, the Costa record. The Inca voter system is a voter-friendly system. It will have a very familiar look and feel to Los Angeles County voters since it is very similar in appearance to the current voting system that is used. The, it should be easier than with respect to punch card ballots. It has been certified to be accurate and reliable, which is the legal standard under California. Which <coughs> brings me to the, the, the final point that I want to make with but respect. But we have no actual uh, data uh, as to the use of the system in LA County. And all of the ones that you have that Dr. Brady talks about, uh, Fresno, Marin, and there was a third one, they all involved, as Judge Tashima pointed out, they all involved precinct scan. You, get, you give the ballot and they tell you, oh, you forgot to vote on something. 
Your Which Honor, LA won't that, have. that seems to me to be a plus in terms of the analysis itself. It seems to me that the basis of the arguments being presented is we should disregard the decertification, which was pursuant to a standard of accuracy and reliability, and in fact took place one day before we were supposed to take the deposition of the Secretary of State officer charged with that, and we should not give value to the certification <coughs> that's been done. I want to turn. I want to turn to the to the Voting Rights Act. I know you'd like to go to the Voting Rights Act, and the, the briefing is excellent <laughs> on both sides. But I, I have a different question. Fair enough. Assume that uh, we didn't go your way on the recall, and the court declined to enjoin the recall. Uh, what is your position on the relationship of the timing of the recall to the ballot initiatives, and what would be the practical effect of a split decision? I appreciate that, Your Honor. I want to make four points with respect to, to the two initiatives, 53 and 54. First, no party in this case, no party in this case has argued with respect to interest that there would be any problem whatsoever in postponing that election back to its original date, which is March. In fact, Your Honor, on July 15, 2002, the Secretary of State, Secretary of State Jones, formally certified Proposition 54 for the March 2004 election. For 375 days, that's when that election was supposed to take place. And with, res with respect to that matter, Your Honors, uh, campaigns were waged, money was raised, everyone operated with the understanding that that's when that, those initiatives would in fact take place. Second, and there was formal notice to all election officials with respect to that. Two, Council, if, can I just finish this point, Judge O'Scanlan? All right, <clears throat> I'll come back to it. S secondly, I'll be back to you. Um, s secondly, um, Judge McCune, if 53 is passed, it does not take effect until 2006, 2007. If 54 is passed, it does not take place until 2005. Moreover, and this is my final point with respect to the package of these two initiatives, because of the at least controversial decision to move these elections from their registered date, the date that was certified, to the October date, 9082, 9092, and 9094 of the California Elections Code have all been violated. Violated in the sense that the sort, the amount That's of... That's not a federal law violation. It isn't, Your Honor, but in terms of what Your Honor has started me with, which is balancing the hardships here, balancing the interest here, the state law interest here, that the voters have enough time to consider that, that is set by the state those three statutes, and in fact, the numbers have been compressed with respect to review of the ballots from 100 to 57 days in terms of review of the, ba the ballot uh, pamphlet itself, with respect to even sending it for corrections, that number was reduced from 80 to 57. Counsel, didn't the Supreme Court of California rule on this on August 8th on Eisenberg versus Shelley? There that specific issue was presented, was it, it not, not specifically rule. that the um, ballot measures be um, reset back to March 4th and that it was error for the Secretary of State to move them up to October 7th. The Supreme Court denied a petition in that matter. That is not a ruling on the merits. Those are, it was done in a matter of a day. There, there, there is no pretense. But wasn't that issue but presented? Either. It was the issue that was presented, but it wasn't. A, it wasn't a matter of. It was not a matter of um, of a legal determination by the Supreme Court, and it wouldn't matter anyway because Judge McEwen's question is asking me how do you balance those interests, and what I'm saying to the court is, however you come out on that, there's no question. They don't dispute that those days were were changed. I don't care whether the determination is it's legal or illegal. The point is, in addition to the fact that the original certification was in March, those times have been. Press. My final point is this, and then I'll sit down and reserve the rest of the time for a rebuttal. Everyone concedes that we're, no matter what side you're on in this matter, that Proposition 54 is a racially focused matter, especially in light of the fact that we know it's undisputed on this record that the numbers in Los Angeles are that 4 to 1, 4 to 1.3 is what happens to minority voters. What does that mean? It means one out of every 25 minority voters who vote in those six counties will not have their votes counted. It's like putting a sign up there, Count every 25th person Council, doesn't need to, doesn't if, need to if vote. If we do split it, then don't we throw away the half million or so absentee ballots that have already been cast on these issues and thus disenfranchise a half million people as the other opposed way around. to maybe 
4,000 people who overvote or undervote and are arguably uh, losing The other way vote. around, Your Honor, if the election goes forward on October 7th with the knowledge that one out of every 25 minority votes in those count counties will not count, then we are treating votes like refuse. And the reality is that, yes, we have, we will. The half million really will be refuse. They'll go on the. No, they won't be refuse. They'll vote again in March when it was originally certified. Is that inconvenient? Of course it's inconvenient. Is that disenfranchisement? It is not disenfranchisement. But why Clark do we need that? Uh, Council, if you wish to uh, sure. reserve any time. Council, before you conclude, I would want you to address the race judicata implications of the consent decree briefly. Sure. Um, Your Honor, the, 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 the test in Judge, in Judge Schroeder's opinion at page 1405 is could a claim have been made? Was the claim made or was it a claim that could not have been made? This was not a claim that could have been made. This, Your Honor, it has snowed three times in Los Angeles since 1923. It has never Counsel, been... Counsel, doesn't that depend on how you define the claim, whether you define it as a particular election? I don't think so, Your Honor, because the, the particular facts surrounding this election, the special... the, spe the the fact of the special election itself could not have existed. If I had gone to Judge Wilson and said, I want to stop an, a, an election in October, he just said, what election? I couldn't even pass the, the Texas Scalia test at page 300 as to rightness with respect to the matter. And there's one other policy point that I want to make with respect to race judicata. When I was negotiating with Mr. Woods, if I had said to Mr. Woods, look, Let's negotiate this. Let's settle for the March election. He said that it's expensive. It's difficult to prepare for. It's, it's difficult to deal with. It's going to cost a lot of time. And I had said to him, oh, but Mr. Woods, I want it to be in October. Why do you want it to be in October? Because there might be a special election. This was taking place in October of 2001 when Governor Davis was still in his first term. That's the import of that. Race judicata isn't supposed to be a straitjacket that permits these sorts of flawed and unconstitutional elections to take Thank place. Thank you, Counsel. We will give you, uh, because you, we Judge helped Schroeder. you use your time, we will give you two minutes on rebuttal. Thank you. Woods. May it please the court, my name is Doug Woods, I'm with the Attorney General's Office and I'm appearing today on behalf of Secretary of State Kevin Shelley. With me is Chief Counsel to the Secretary of State Randy Riddle. Plaintiffs filed their motion in this case asking Judge Wilson for a preliminary injunction to stop the October election. They based their motion on untested speculation as to re what residual votes would be in the outcome of that election. Judge Wilson looked at their motion. He saw no merit to their claims. What he did see was the harm and disruption that would come from canceling the October election. Judge Wilson determined across the board, element by element, exercising his judgment, his discretion, he determined across the board that this is not a case for a preliminary injunction. He was right then, 30 days ago, when this election was imminent, today, with this election ongoing, he is even more right. Do you agree with Professor Tribe that this is de novo on the law review, or should this be abuse of discretion? Your Honor, the law, the law of this circuit, the law of the land, is that this is an abuse of discretion review. There, there is not a single... Even if we're convinced that the district court got the law wrong? There, there is not a single legal point in the district court's decision that is in dispute. Well, maybe that's right, but that's a different question. That's, that's a different question. The question is, do we look at whether he got the law right, or do we sort of say, close enough? Your Honor, you, <laughs> I mean, Your it's Honor, government work after all. Your Honor, right? th this, court, this court is entitled to look at whether he got the law right. I submit that he did. Plaintiffs do not. He accept. sort of missed it on the Voting Rights Act, right, just between us. No. <laughs> I, I won't tell if you won't tell. No, Your Honor. He, he, he was right on, on the Voting Rights Act that we're talking about a totality of the circumstances analysis of whether or not a minority race or minority language group has been disenfranchised and not you, had... You, you think his analysis is consistent with Salt River and Farrakhan? I, I realize he didn't have Farrakhan, but he did have Salt River. Uh, and, and I... 
I mean, it, it, the, 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 the evidence seems to be in the record, and the, you know, the district court didn't resolve the dispute, so we have to take plaintiff's case that there is a greater error rate for punch card ballots than for other methods, first. Second of all, that counties that use punch card ballots are more heavily Minor, uh, have greater minority populations than other counties. And third, there is evidence, I read the affidavit, that the number of residual votes, the votes rejected by the machines, is greater in minority districts than in, than in other districts. Th those, those are the facts, more or less, the plaintiffs rely on for their, for their Section 2 claim. Why isn't the district court's analysis, application of the Section 2, um, uh, law in this area is simply wrong. What, what Judge Wilson said was that the allegations that plaintiffs make about what has happened in the past and <coughs> guess as to what may happen in the future might be sufficient to satisfy the liberal pleading standards in the federal court and to stay in the case. But that's a far different proposition from demonstrating a likelihood of success in a preliminary injunction what, setting. What do you make of Roberts versus Ramser? The St. Louis case that in 1989 held there was a Section 2 violation. This was 12 years before Bush versus Gore? Yes, uh, right. Held a bit because of the use of punch card ballots, uh, precisely in a situation very similar to ours. Your Honor, I, I don't remember. Now, I realize the Eighth Circuit reversed it on, on, on other grounds, but there was a finding by a district court on the merits. You, you're familiar with the case? Yes, I'm familiar it's with the a, case. It's in the books. And, and in the circumstances of that case, it may have been sufficient to, to state a claim, but in terms of a preliminary injunction to stop an ongoing or even imminent election, that wasn't at issue in that case. And, and in, in Wamser... But, but we have to feel a lot worse about... I mean, we can go to the balancing of the equities and we can look at a lot of other things, but if we think the district court got the law wrong as to Section 2, but again, I'm, I'm not looking at Bush versus Gore right now. I'm, I'm looking at the, at, the, at the Voting Rights Act. That itself is a basis for, would be a basis for granting an injunction if the court weighed the equities correctly, the public harm, and so on, and if it got the law right. Uh, Your Honor, ev even if Judge Wilson got, got the law incorrect by, by considering the totality of the circumstances in the absence of a demonstration of a totality of the circumstances, even if he got the law incorrect in doing that, the, the public interest is still a required element of the consideration of, a, of A, a preliminary injunction, and, and B, equitable relief on a Voting Rights Act claim by itself, even outside of, of a preliminary Counsel, injunction. Counsel, I wonder, I wonder if a distinction needs to be drawn here. As I recall, we drew the distinction in sports form between a preliminary and coalition for economic equity between a preliminary injunction that depends on a determination of law by the district court, which we may reverse on a de novo determination that the district court got the law wrong, and a preliminary injunction where the district court has not made a conclusion as to what the law is, but only evaluated probability of success on the merits and that we review only for abuse of discretion under sports form. And as I read lines 19 through 24 of page 22 of the district court's decision, he's very careful not to make a determination on the law under section two of the Voting Rights <coughs> Act, only to make a determination of probability of success on the merits with regard to section two of the Voting Rights Act. Am I missing something there? You're, you're correct, Your Honor. That that he was looking at the likelihood of success in the merits, making his best judgment based on what he had in front of him and based on his understanding of the law, which I submit is, was correct, that he had to, to take into account the totality of the circumstances as to whether or not a, a race, color, or language minority group had been denied an opportunity to, to participate in the political process. Uh, but, I, but, but, but that would depend on external circumstances in Los Angeles County, things like polarized voting, uh, whether or not uh, there were a variety of uh, candidates of the same race and so, uh, so on that, that came from those districts. And the only information we have about that is Garza, where 11 years ago we held that there was a violation of the Voting Rights Act in LA County. 
we said there was, in fact. I mean, we upheld the district court's findings in that case that there was, in fact, racially polarized voting, that there was, in fact, uh, a variety of factors that, that supported the sex, uh, a violation of the Voting Rights Act. That's all the information we have. Have things changed in LA County well, so much in 11 years? Uh, well, maybe they have. Uh, your Honor, and, and that would be a fair consideration if, if plaintiffs had presented that to Judge Wilson for his consideration. They elected to submit their Voting Rights Act claim strictly on the statistical disparity between residual vote counts in punch card counties and residual vote counts in non-punch card counties. If they had wanted to consider and wanted Judge Wilson to consider the Garza information, that would have been a fair consideration. All of the other Senate factors in the Senate report in support of, of uh, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act also would have been fair considerations. They but but you do agree that the district court did not apply the Senate factors. Uh, are we in agreement that far? Your, Your Honor, the district they court... did not do a full bore Section 2 analysis. It, it, other, other than well, whether, they, whether the plaintiff is guilty of, uh, is responsible or not, the district court did not do a full bore Section 2 analysis. Did, mo did not make a Section 2 finding. That's correct, Your Honor. <laughs> but he, he did know, Judge Wilson did know, that the plaintiffs had failed to present all of the, the Senate factors in their Section 2 presentation in support of the preliminary injunction motion. Indeed, there are no findings here at all. Isn't that, isn't that part of the problem? <clears throat> and, and, and furthermore, uh, whatever the assertions are, they're in dispute. They're, they're Honor, the, the most important finding that Judge Wilson made was that it is in the public interest to proceed with a scheduled election that is imminent. That was a compelling interest 30 days ago. It is all the more compelling today. Could you tell me why, with respect to the recall election, and splitting that out from the ballot initiatives, <coughs> he gave pretty short shrift to the balancing of hardship on the initiatives. He just said, it's the same. How could he say it's the same when they don't go into effect till 2005, 2006, when you don't give the California voters the rights that California law provides them in terms of time for preparation of voters pamphlet, and when you have in the very challenge on a race issue, you have a race-related initiative. So I'm <coughs> interested to know, given even on an abuse of discretion standard, how his sort of passing footnote on this would meet, even meet that standard. It is, it is imperative that this court understands that the question in this case is whether the plaintiffs have presented any justification for stopping the October election. That question is devoid of any topic in terms of what is, what is in the, the recall election, what issues are at stake, what issues are, are at stake in the well, initiatives. Just now, you just said the most important question was the public interest, and that doesn't that require a separate analysis, one, for the recall, and two, on the initiatives? Uh, no. Different interests are at stake? No, Your Honor. For the reason Judge McEwen outlined? And, that, and that's what I, it's, it's important for me to convey that to the court today. The interest that the public has is in holding their election. It's an interest that is not a function of what is being elected. It is not a function of whether uh, it's a recall or a successor. Oh, sh surely, recall. surely, don't mean that. Well, two the separate issues. Certify that, certify the vote to, to take place in March, right? And California law required that the initiative, initiatives be moved up to be held at the next, the next statewide election, and that, as it turned out, was the October 7th election. That is that what the California Supreme California. Court of California determined in the Eisenberg case? Obviously, it was a one-line denial of petition, but can we read anything into that? Not just the Eisenberg case, Your Honor, but also the Takash case. And in that case, the, or, the court issued a specific order uh, saying that, indeed, the Secretary of State did not have discretion to set the initiative elections at some at some later date after the after the October seventh recall statewide election. So the court basically was saying that amendments made by the commission later on essentially took out the or language and the state was required in the Supreme Court's view to put it on the next election. Is that correct? The Supreme Court decision in Takash yes, was, inter was, in, was interpreting and looking at the legislative history, which convinced the Supreme Court this is not something that no, legislative history didn't just happen. No, there was the commission, there were the amendments. Right, and, and the Supreme Court so said... So in your view, actually, the Secretary of State had no discretion that's correct. other than to put it on the ballot. That's correct, in my view and the California Supreme Court's view. Okay. Counsel, before you're done, I have a question about the claim preclusion issue. And that is, uh, what 
effect, if any, is there that there is a party in this proceeding that was not a party in the common cause case and whether Green requires us or required the district court to look at that, uh, that factor uh, as being dispositive of claim preclusion for the new party? The, um, the, the plaintiffs never contested our race judicata point that there is identity of parties. They didn't contest it in the district court proceeding. When Judge Wilson... So even if we find that there actually is a different party that was not bound by the prior litigation, we should ignore that? Your, Your Honor, I, I, I say that as, as a prelude to, to saying this court should not find that there is a different party. The new party was, was represented uh, well in the original Common Cause action. Uh, Judge, Judge Wilson, in his evaluation, as he judged the similarity of interest between the NAACP, which is the new party here, and Southern Christian and Southwest Voter, uh, noted the identity of the interests, the legal interests that were being advanced, the Common Cause action and the action here, and said that the introduction of the new plaintiff, the NAACP, <coughs> did not prevent race judicata. Your view, is that consistent with uh, our recent holding in Green versus City of Tucson? Yes, Your Honor. In Green versus City of Tucson was a younger abstention case. That was, that's, that's a case where the, the federal court is, is saying, should we proceed uh, with this party who is, is, is not a party to a, to a state proceeding that's going on? Should we, should we proceed? Um, that's a different consideration with different principles under, underlying it. Um, then is the race judicata. There's no reason for a district court uh, judge, Judge Wilson, who actually had presided over the common cause matter, there's no reason for Judge Wilson to um, allow the, the case to proceed uh, over a race judicata, judicata objection based on his own uh, understanding of the, the, the plaintiff's participation in the prior case. Counsel, so the, if you wish to um, cede any time to your to the Pardon? intervener. The intervener, I believe, uh, wishes to be I'm sorry, have I used my 20 minutes, Your Honor? I, yeah. I think he's no, no, he's got 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Oh, there was 20 the 20 on the clock? Okay, I, I apologize. I apologize. That's right. Go ahead. Counsel, is there a privity analysis that goes into that uh, race judicata uh, determination in your view? Yes, Your Honor. The privity analysis is if, if the new party's interests uh, are so aligned with the prior party's interests, uh, then, then they are considered to have been virtually represented in the prior case, and their presence in this case does not bar application of race judicata. Judge Wilson compared the allegations from, uh, as to the NAACP's interest in this case, compared them to the interests of Southern Christian identified in the prior case, and he quoted from the complaint and compared them. He didn't have to stop there. There were 14 other plaintiffs in the Common Cause case. Uh, each, each, and I could, uh, in the interest of time, I won't, but I could walk through each of those plaintiffs, organizations and individuals, all of whom were saying, we don't want to use punch card machines. We think that they have uh, high residual vote rates, and that, we think, hurts us, and it hurts us in particular because we are people of color, Latinos, African Americans, and Asian Americans. Organizations, individuals, all saying the exact same thing. Mr. Well, what, what, would you agree that even if the privity argument were either forfeited or waived and you were correct on the claims analysis, that this court would have the discretion in an extraordinary case not to invoke uh, the collateral estoppel or res judicata? Your Honor, th this, court is, this court is bound to defer to the judgment of Judge Wilson. And Judge Wilson's judgment. Well, they argue it's not the same issue. Is that a pure legal issue? Uh, the evaluation as to whether, breaking it down, the, if there were a question as to the legal standard that were applied, I would say de novo, as, as plaintiffs would say. But there's no dispute about the legal standard that's to be applied. The, the dispute is to whether or not the NAACPs, and I don't even know if there's a dispute about this at this point. Well, there they, they, they do argue point. that this is a different legal issue. They say, look, we agreed, and they, the state agreed to change uh, to change <coughs> machines in March. We're not disputing that. You're still changing machines in March. Now we're disputing whether or not you can hold an election before you do that. It's right. a diff uh, they argue it's a different issue. Wh why is that not, in fact, a different enough issue to say that an important case like this, res judicata, shouldn't apply? 
And Your Honor, that goes to the, to the same claim element of the res judicata uh, defense. But, that, but, but our decision on that is a legal determination based on the stated claims, is it not? That's not an abuse of discretion. That's pure legal issue to determine that, is it not? No, no Your Honor. This court has established a standard at, to determine whether a claim is the same claim as a prior claim for res judicata purposes. Uh, would the same evidence be introduced? Are the same are there the same allegations of infringement of a legal interest? Is it the, is it the same common transaction of a uh, nu nucleus of transactional fact? Would the rights established in the prior action be impaired by prosecution of the second action? All of those are factual determinations that require Judge Wilson to determine on each of those discrete elements whether or not race judicata was supported. Once he, once he evaluated those, and, and it, as we've noted, he didn't even actually make a finding. He just said, looking at each of those elements, I see that, that this, this action is barred, is likely barred, and, and plaintiffs are unlikely to, to succeed on the merits of their claims. And um, sp specifically, uh, Judge Kaczynski, I, I believe you are getting to the question of foreseeability uh, you know, whether plaintiffs sh should have been held to some uh, specific knowledge that the recall election would unfold and, and the initiatives... I, I was actually getting the question of our discretion, uh, okay. which is what Judge McEwen was asking you about. If it's dead bang, dead bang the same legal issue, then maybe you're right. Maybe we're bound and we have no discretion. But it strikes me that the issue is sufficiently dissimilar that we might apply res judicata, but... To, to, to get, I think this is a question Judge McEwen asked, don't we have discretion not to do so? Uh, in, and, and, in, and, in my and, view, and Your Honor? In, in light of the fact that the issues really are slightly different. Please answer the question briefly. <clears throat> in my view, Your Honor, the, the, uh, the abuse of discretion standard requires that this court not substitute its judgment for Judge Wilson's unless his judgment was an abuse of discretion. The court can review his decision, but only... Is that yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> I asked you, do we have discretion? And you gave me a long answer, but... Your, your uh, Honor, is the, do, do, do we have discretion or do we not have discretion? The court, the court does not have discretion. You know, I figured you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you. Have, you have uh, used your time. We'll hear from Mr. Diamond for the intervener. Chief Judge Schroeder, I may please the court. Charles Diamond on behalf of the intervener, uh, Ted Costa, who is the proponent. Does Mr. Costa take a position on the initiatives? Uh, Mr. Costa does not take a position on the initiative in the words of one of the judges. I just want to get that out of the way. We don't have a dog in that hunt. Uh, okay. I, there, there are three subjects I want to address in the brief time that I have. Number one, the, the constitutional issue, whether there's an equal protection violation here, any basis for it, given the disparities of residual rates between punch cards and other alternatives. I'd like to talk briefly about the Voting Rights Act and whether uh, Judge Wilson got it right, which I believe he did. And then I would like to talk briefly about the public interests here and the rights of California voters and how they would be best served uh, by an outcome in this case. With respect to the, the constitutional equal protection issue, I, I sense the the constitutional sands are shifting under our feet as we listen to Professor Tribe. This was not the position taken in the district court. This is not the he position. He probably had the same feeling a couple of years ago. Uh, basically, the, the, position, the position before was any disparity um, uh, constitutes an equal protection violation, no matter how minimal. And I think uh, counsel for the plaintiffs have recognized that, that that just doesn't fly. It doesn't make sense, and it's not consistent with 40 years of Supreme Court. It flies in the face of uh, Bush and Gore, uh, and it's unjustifiable. What we're, we're told now, entirely differently, uh, is that uh, the equal protection violation arises because some counties are using machines that were prospectively decertified at a future date um, uh, where others are using machines that remain certified through the indefinite future. Well, I, I don't see, and, and I, I would like to hear Professor Tribe explain in his rebuttal time, how you get a violation out of simply a concession by the state that they're going to decertify, particularly as, as several of the judges on this court pointed out, Secretary Jones emphatically, emphatically avoided saying that punch cards were defective or unreliable or inaccurate or not trustworthy. What but he they, said. But they back it up. 
with a Brady study. It's not just a decertification. They do back it up with a Brady. I'd love to talk to you about, about the Brady study. I figured study. you would. Um, you know, I, what, first of all, what, what does the Brady study show at most using 2,000 presidential returns? It shows that there is a 1.27 percentage point spread between punch cards and other voting devices. Uh, other alternative voting devices. We don't, this is not a peer-reviewed study. We've never seen where those numbers came from, but I am taking Mr. Dr. Brady at his word that that's, those are what the numbers show. That doesn't constitute a constitutional violation. The, the Supreme Court made clear that mathematical what the, what precision. The, what if LA County said we're only gonna count every other vote? Uh, you know, we let everybody vote. You know, we believe in voting. We really like it. But we're only going to count, we're not going to count all the votes. We're going to count some of them. I'm not that, gonna, that, I'm that, not, that wouldn't fly. Would I'm not going to stand up here and, and argue with you that, that under no conceivable circumstances could you find an equal protection violation to arise because well, I gave of you, disparate I gave, treatment. I, I gave you one. But that would be pers purposeful. That would be intentional. It would be irrational. It would be arbitrary. It would be all of the, the things that the Supreme Court in Burdick and in, in Anderson. They're saying all those things about punch card ballots. Not, 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 so, not so at all. But let me now, now we're dickering about how much. I'm sorry? Now we're dickering about how much. Uh, how, much how much of a non-county, non-counting of ballots are counties allowed to do before they run into constitutional violation? We're now no longer talking principle, we're talking about numbers. Uh, and, and, the, and the Supreme Court precedents teach us that, it, that election officials have uh, a, a plentiful discretion, have wide discretion to make decisions uh, involving what kind of equipment they're going to use to respond to local needs. It's, this is not all about error. Doesn't Bush versus Gore instruct us that we cannot value one person's vote over that of another? And doesn't the disparity, in fact, do that? When you read some of the language in Bush, Bush versus Gore at 30,000 feet the way the plaintiffs do, you can find something for any appetite. Um, I, don't, I don't disagree with that, but... Are you we, saying that's dicta? I am saying that's, that is dicta as applied to the facts of this case. What, let's look at what the Supreme, Supreme Court did in uh, 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 Bush and Gore, not what it said in Bush but, and Gore. So we're to disregard what the court says? In its opinion? No. It, what it said was that a high level of generality is not a, not a proposition that anybody in this court disputes. We all agree, as Justice O'Connor says, that one man, one vote, or one person, one vote, is, is an admirable goal, and that's what the Constitution aspires to. But the Supreme Court also taught us in Reynolds v. Sims that we have to apply that with some level of real, realism and practicality. And, and what can you do as a practical matter? We know because the Supreme Court in Bush v. Gore, which had a differential uh, between punch card error rate, punch card differential rate and other forms used in Florida of twice what is alleged here, twice of the worst case here, you know, you is certified you, you, you those you results made, and seated a president. You made that argument in your brief, and I, I chuckled a little bit. Uh, they, they didn't have a choice there. It's not that like they could go back and say, don't use those machines. So they had no occasion to talk about whether up front it was okay to use such differences. They were faced with a situation where the balance had been cast, and now they were at the recount stage. Whatever we think about what they might have said, we can't really imply anything as to their view about a priori differences in vote voting systems. Isn't that right? Um, I, I disagree. Number one, we have four justices uh, who took the position that this was, there was something that could be done. You could have a recount and you could promulgate standards. Uh, there was a question of timing and there was disagreement as to whether there was sufficient time within which to do that. But the Supreme Court would not have reversed its precedents, would not have tossed Reynolds v. Sims into the <coughs> dustpan of history without telling us that they were doing that. Um, and, and I can't, can't imagine that the Supreme Court would not have, in at least a footnote, said, we have grave concern about this differential, but we are driven by the exigency of the, of the situation. So this is, there the, is, nothing this is, this there. is the absence of dicta. You, we was, were supposed to read a holding from the fact the Supreme Court didn't say we're troubled by this fact we can't do anything about. I, I think you have to read Bush v. Gore alongside with the other Supreme Court precedents. We, we know from... So why don't you answer my question, yes or no? 
Let's say the county. There's nothing let, good I, I, could come I, I, of me I, I, answering your question. I'm yes sorry? or no, I suspect. <laughs> It must have been funny, I didn't hear it, but it I must have been. Uh, <laughs> the, the, let's say LA County knows that its air rate of its machine is 10%. One out of every 10 votes doesn't count, but you know, close enough for government to work. And, uh, and, and we're gonna keep using them because they're cheap and convenient, people are used to them. And most of the time it makes no difference at all. Bush versus Gore violation is a violation of equal protection under the long line of cases going back to Reynolds versus Sims and Baker versus Carr, or can a county say, hey, close enough? Uh, yes I think, or no? I think a court would want to take a, a searching look at that. 10%, we are told, are, uh, is de minimis 50%. In, in the reapportionment 50%, 50%, 50%? I'm sorry? One every, every other vote. Well, 50%, I think we'd want to take a searching look at that, but that's not what this case is about. Nine <laughs> votes out of 10. What this case, I, this I, I feel like Abraham. Well, what, <laughs> it, 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 I, I would argue I might not be representing Mr. Costa if the case were, were that, but that's not the case. What we have is a decision by the LA County authorities that the registrar you know, the city I am, the I'm inferring something from your absence of an answer more often from the Supreme Court's absence of a footnote. <laughs> I, I, gather, I, I, I gather you agree implicitly that there comes a point that if the machinery is defective enough in counting votes that even your client would agree that there is an equal protection violation. I, if, I, is that not true? If local election officials are working as diligently as they possibly can to address that problem and have a timetable to replace those machines, I say you don't stop an election. You don't prevent everybody from voting because some of the people who do vote may have their votes counted erroneously. I mean, that's the operative principle, and that's what we have. Reynolds v. Sims says good faith effort to achieve substantial equality. The, the also, is postponement the same as prevention in your view? I'm sorry? Is postponement of the election the same as the prevention of an election in your view? Well, I think Judge Wilson got it, got it right. I mean, uh, you, you don't call an October election that's held in May an October election. Elections. What's your best case authority for the proposition that prevention of an election is the same that is the same as pro postponement of an election? What's your best case authority for that argument? I think that the Supreme Court re rep uh, recognized in um, uh, Anderson versus Calabrese, uh, if I recall correctly, that you you cannot look at an election apart from when it is held. That things change too quickly, and that election held one month is an entirely different election if it's held a month later. Um, let, let me, I, I don't think I'm gonna have time to get to the Voting Rights Act unless you ask me a, a question after my time expires. Tell me about the Voting Rights Act. <laughs> we're gonna give you an extra two minutes because we're giving what you do, What do you make of that case from St. Louis, uh, the one I First mentioned, one. Roberts versus Ramza? Um, Section two violation case? based, excuse if, me? If we're talking about the same, this, this was a case that was reversed on other grounds. Never went the distance, right? Reverse on other okay. grounds. Section two, uh, not a constitutional violation. And there was a full-blown record in that case, as I recall it, uh, it which led the court, and it may well have been an inept defense attorney who was resisting the claim. I, I know it can be distinguished. It was also St. Louis, and the guy's name was Roberts rather than uh, Costa. So I know we can distinguish it, but the point is, 12 years before, or 11 years before Bush versus Gore, a district court on a full evidentiary record found a Section 2 violation because of the use of punch card ballots in a large metropolitan uh, uh, county or city, not unlike Los Angeles in many ways. But in fairness, uh, in, in fairness to everyone, you also have to acknowledge that that case was not reviewed on the merits of the Section 2 uh, claim. It was reversed on the grounds. We don't know how it would have come out had it not been reversed. I'm not saying you couldn't prove a Section 2 claim based upon the use, maybe intentionally, purposefully. You only put bad punch card machines uh, in minority precincts, but you put good punch card machines or other devices in some non... I'm not saying you couldn't prove it. You agree that the Section 2 case is closer than the equal protection case? Um, I, I, no. 
No, I think I, well, I think they are both dead bang winners, and they're both easy. And I think Wilson got the Section Two claim right because he followed this court's teaching in Salt River and Farrakhan uh, to the effect that a bare statistical showing of disproportionate impact on a minority racial minority does not satisfy the Section Two results inquiry. That's a quote from Salt River, and that's all the plaintiffs gave him. Thank you, Counsel. Your Thank time you. has expired. Mr. Tribe, are you stepping up to the bat? <laughs> Thank you, Chief Judge Schroeder. A couple of things. First of all, I think with respect to Propositions 53 and 54, you've been given no real reason, none, uh, either in terms of the balance of the equities <coughs> or in terms of California law where it is not a settled matter. Uh, well, let's talk about injunctive relief, Professor. You're, you're essentially asking us to invalidate more than a half a million votes that have already been cast, and there's plenty of time after the election for you and your clients to challenge in the California courts or the it, federal courts the, uh, the lawfulness of those If it's close enough, Your Honor, but so much turns on the fact that the right to vote is an independently valued <coughs> right, even if you are massively outvoted. That really bears also on Judge Kaczynski's question because with respect to the Brady data, unless the election is so close that a hand count occurs, the further step that you're talking about never happens. The Brady data is therefore undisputed and therefore some of your hypotheticals are very close to the truth. This is deliberate and intentional <coughs> decision to keep something that they have recognized as defective. But as to the idea that enjoining an election is so extraordinary, Justice Kennedy uh, wrote for a unanimous court in 1961 in Clark v. Romer that 91. even if, pardon? 61, he was still in law school. Uh, 1991, <laughs> I'm sorry, 1991. Uh, 61, I guess I was in law school too. Uh, he wrote that the fact that absentee voting had begun, the fact that time and expense was invested, are not reasons, not even legitimate reasons, to deny an injunction. That was a Section 5 claim. That's right, but and we don't we all see... Know, we all know Section 5 claims are different because you are dealing with... Pre-clearance. Pre-clearance and a finding, a prior finding of intentional discrimination. Do you There's have none a of that here. Well, the, the Which does not happen here. Do you have a single non-Section 5 case involving an injunction? An injunction against an election. Without... A section five, uh, On August 22nd of this year, uh, the Northern District of New York in Arbor Hill uh, concerned citizens against City of Albany issued an injunction, I am told, I haven't read it, it was read to me over the phone, uh, issued an injunction uh, in a Section 2 case. But the most important point to be made is that if an election is illegal, as it surely is if you deliberately decide to discard a number of the votes. Uh, the proposition that because it's illegality and indeed it's unconstitutionality doesn't occur in the institutional context of preclearance or with intent uh, is somewhat perpendicular to the point. The real point, I think, is it's an unlawful election and there is no meaningful retrospective remedy doesn't for Reynolds many of those voters whose votes were not counted. Doesn't Reynolds v. Sims expressly and directly contradict you on that? It says, go ahead with an illegal <coughs> election when it's imminent. You may answer that and then your time has expired. Well, the answer is no because it says that it is possible when you are doing your best and you've updated it with the decennial census that you ought to go ahead with the election. Imminence is a factor, uh, but in this case, especially with respect to propositions uh, 53 and 4, uh, you haven't been given a reason. I, I was hoping uh, that Mr. Rosenblum could have a moment uh, to address the Voting Rights Act claim. Uh, but uh, well, we'll give him. We'll give him 30 seconds if he has something that he well, thank you, Your Honor. really needs to say. He's a fast talker. He can do. <laughs> I have three points, and I'll try to make them all at once. Um, <laughs> first, Wamser is on point, Your Honor. It, in 1531 and 1532, it's precisely the problem that we're talking about here. That's where Judge Hungate talked about a significant number of uncounted ballots as a result of the system. Two, the critical question, going all the way back to Jingles at page 63, the critical question is, does an electoral practice or structure result in members of a protected group having less opportunity than other members to participate in the political process? As this court said just two months ago, 
ago. Actually, it was in front of Judge Wilson. He didn't cite the case, the Farrakhan case. At pages 1015 and 1085, what we're talking about is an unequal access to the political process. Final point. What's the evidence in this case? The evidence in this case is undisputed, absolutely undisputed. The California, what Dr. Brady did was he took California precincts and he took 0% minority precincts and he took 100% minority precincts and he asked, was there any difference here? And what he found in terms of causation, what he found was that there was a three times disparity. Then he looked, and this is at figure three, then he looked at those districts that had changed, changed from punch card to other machines. And he found, and this is at pages 165 and 167 of the record, that the disparity virtually disappeared, that it completely examined. That is, Your Honor, the strongest case that has ever been in this circus, circuit with <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you should have quit while you're ahead. <laughs> Guess who's the biggest clown? The case just argued is the court appreciates <laughs> the court appreciates very much the high degree of the quality of preparation that went into uh, these arguments, especially on such short notice. So that concludes the court session. This court stands adjourned. All rise. The Ninth Circuit could render its decision as soon as today or even tomorrow. We'll have a link to that on our website. It's at cspan.org, and you'll find it in the section we call FYI. By the way, it is possible that this decision itself could be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. In London today, British Defense Minister Jeffrey Hoon and former spokesman for the Prime Minister Alistair Campbell testified before the commission looking into the death of scientist David Kelly and his testimony on Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. Coming up, we'll be showing you coverage